In this video, I'm going to talk about some basic narrative concepts, um, specifically more genre and audience, but more broadly, why those concepts and looking at narrative concepts more generally is important right now. And I'm going to talk about why we use stories and those techniques and the problems that that brings. So first of all, those three key narrative concepts. Um, Mode is a concept, a very simple concept, the idea of the way that a story is told, whether that's written or visual or oral. Um, we need to think about genre in particular, and later in the module we'll spend some more time looking at genre. But the genre of a story is really important for us as professional storytellers because it sets expectations with the audience. It also um, determines our production processes. So genre is really central to think about as a media producer. And finally, and equally importantly, the idea of audience. What makes us professional storytellers, professional media workers, is this idea of having an audience, of working for an audience. Um, we're not just doing it for ourselves, for our own pleasure. And when we look at narrative theory, we find that audience isn't just something that exists out there. It's not just a, a group of people that watches or listens to or reads their stories. Um, it's something that we construct in the way that we create our stories. We make all sorts of assumptions about our audience, their knowledge, first of all, and, and the language that they might be comfortable with, um, but also culture, geography, and that's particularly important right now. And in fact, all these concepts are really important right now because in the last couple of decades, all of these three concepts have been the subject of immense change. So in terms of the mode of storytelling, in the last couple of decades, this has become increasingly multimodal. As media producers, we are expected to work not just in one medium. We're not just videographers working in video. We're not just radio producers working in audio or writers working with text. We're expected to be able to operate across multiple modes. And that's a large focus of this module. Likewise, genre has proliferated enormously over the last decade. We've got new genres, new formats. So a new genre might be something like social video or the listicle. A new format would be something like vertical video. And that's made it more difficult to uh, create predictable production and have people who have the right skills. And finally, audience has changed as well. We have a much um, different, uh, a much changed idea of our audience now because of analytics data. So we now know much more about what our audience reads or watches. We have information down to the level of uh, how long they watch for or when they stop watching or when they stop reading, whether they've shared it or commented on it, how engaged they are. And related to that, the audience themselves are increasingly active in our media production. They may well have a central role in the stories that we're telling. So because of this immense change, that's uh, essentially the main reason for this module in narrative. It's about giving the skills to adapt to ongoing change and understand how to produce stories across those platforms and new modes and new genres and with new relationships of audiences. To illustrate that in terms of genre, this is a piece of research from way back in 1998 when the, the internet was um, first becoming popularised. This was a, a piece of research by Shepard and Waters, and they were already at that point, over 20 years ago, identifying how genre was being affected by this new medium. And they identified two types of genres. They found um, what they called extant subgenres. Uh, by this, what they meant is that existing genres were being recreated online. So um, they were looking at the area of news, which is my particular area of interest, and they were finding that websites were recreating the newspaper and the newspaper homepage. But in addition, they also found spontaneous genres, new genres. Here they identify the hot list, which is a, a list of links. But the broader point is that 
this new medium was creating new genres and also replicating old genres, what's called remediation. Now, since then, these genres have undergone further change. So the hot list doesn't really exist anymore. It's, it's been replaced by other forms of curation, which we'll come on to elsewhere in the module. And a newspaper homepage, the web page for a newspaper, is now very different to a, a physical newspaper. Equally, we have some more recent research from Ron Yorva and Wesley talking about the role of users in the creation of genres. Historically, we as professional media producers would have the leading role, possibly the only role, in forming new genres. Uh, we would invent things like cutaways, things like the voiceover. Um, whereas now, increasingly, a lot of that innovation takes place outside of professional media production. If you look at new genres like the live blog, or if you look at how vertical video is produced or Snapchat stories, um, a lot of the innovation in that has come from non-professionals and then professionals have seen that innovation and adapted to that and adopted it in their own production. So we've moved from this um, one-to-many mass media approach to a many-to-many -many approach. If you want to get an idea of this, this is a, a video from um, BBC News Labs about some of the new story formats that they've been experimented with. This is available in the slides for this week, so it's well worth taking some time to look at that, um, particularly if you're operating in uh, one of the journalism courses. But there's, there's a big problem with these stories. There's a big problem with narrative as a whole, and that's um, that it makes our production routinized and standardized and that can create blind spots it can lead us to to towards lazy storytelling stereotypes so this is one of the core reasons why as professional media producers we should be paying attention to narrative concepts and being critical in a way that we look at our own work now the reason for these um, standardized routines is because again the professionalism it, it's important that, that we can produce stories relatively quickly to a deadline um, and to be able to cooperate and collaborate with others who all understand the rules of this but it also creates its blind spots for example um, in, in one great article by a, a guy called Grosser he, he writes about the, what he calls the law of narrative gravity and this is the idea that when there is a, a bigger narrative going on, uh, that tends to shape and attract stories that other people tell. So it, it almost shapes the perception of facts. And the particular, um, if you like, story that he was interested in was the tech bubble narrative. The idea that we're, we're all uh, in the middle of a tech bubble where um, technology companies value is overinflated and that that shapes the other stories that are told about this sphere but you could you can see this elsewhere in things like if you take a an area like global warming for example the bigger story is that we are going through a, a period of global warming and there's danger to the planet um, and that will shape other stories that people tell Likewise, counter-narratives to that, so there are stories about, well, there is no global warming and it's some sort of conspiracy. That's also a big story that shapes stories that are told. Now, the point here is not whether one is true or one is false, but just that these are two big stories that shape the other stories that are told, and other stories fall into that. You might hear this called agenda setting. Um, we often follow what's on the agenda, what's um, topical at the moment, so topicality is part of that. Um, but we should be careful that we're not just kind of blindly fall, falling into these uh, topical stories and that we, we're telling new stories. A really good example of this is the film Nightcrawler. Um, this is well worth watching if you haven't already seen it or re-watching it. Um, there's a scene about an hour and 50 minutes in which is, uh, demonstrates this absolutely perfectly. Um, the central character in Nightcrawler is a videographer who chases ambulances and police cars to, to film footage that he then sells. Earlier in the film, there is a story about um, a 
what, what's described as a home invasion, a wealthy suburban house invaded by burglars. And it's reported as that sort of story. Then later in the film, and this is a spoiler alert, so skip ahead if you uh, don't want this to be spoiled, but it's not a massive spoiler, it's not central to the film. Um, later in the film, they find drugs in the house and they realise that it wasn't actually a home invasion, it was a drug robbery, the people in the house were drug dealers. And this, there's this great interaction between the presenter and the uh, editor where they're arguing over what the story is. And Nina, the presenter, says the information detracts from the story. The story is urban crime creeping into the suburbs, innocent victims. That's the story. So she doesn't want to tell this more factual story about actually these victims were not innocent. They were drug dealers and it was much more complex because she doesn't feel that that fits into the bigger story that they're selling to their viewers. And that's a classic example of this idea of of narrative gravity that, that sometimes um, we need to change our story because of the fact. Some other concepts that are useful in this respect are um, the blame frame and the explain frame. So when we're talking about events and who or what is responsible for those events, um, the blame frame puts that responsibility on human agents and uh, focuses on punishment and justice whereas the explain frame focuses on natural causes or quasi-natural causes. Um, and this particular research by Shaheen argues that both frames reproduce social boundaries and reinforce the status quo. The broader point here is that essentially this is falling into particular habits and routines, cliches, stereotypes. So always be conscious of that and whether that's the appropriate story to tell. Are you actually telling the, a, a, the true story or is it just a, a lazy way to form a narrative? Crime and terrorism stories uh, are worth emphasising in particular with this. So in crime and terrorism stories, we often talk about conflict rather than clarity. Uh, we of, often focus on opinion rather than explanation. And this desire to tell a story often misleads people. People think that crime is much higher than it is. They often think that it's going up when it's not. They often misjudge the risk of being a victim of a terrorism attack, for example. They think it's much higher than it really is. And that's because we tell stories that skew reality around that. So again, being conscious of this and thinking about alternative approaches is really important. But Having said all of these things about the weaknesses of stories, the issues with stories, we still need them. Um, it's not necessarily that we can stop using stories because they're bad things and we just present a list of facts. That's not going to be effective because we still need to attract audiences, retain them, engage them, help them to remember what they need to know. Um, and there's a lot of research which supports the role of stories in engaging people in interesting information. So um, there's research that says it increases recall, the use of melodrama in um, South American TV in this particular instance, that people get more involved in stories and that people are better informed. This is particularly the case, my area again is news, but this is a case um, within that and more broadly. And just to finish off with one example of this, this was a, a, an example I came across at a conference a couple of years ago um, looking at fact-checking. And obviously there's a lot of misinformation uh, on social media and in chat apps like WhatsApp. And uh, some organisations are trying to find ways to tackle this misinformation, hoaxes, fake news, things like that. And... One approach that has been particularly successful in a, a Spanish project is to adopt the same storytelling techniques as the people spreading this information. So using memes, using visual storytelling. And that's a classic example of, of thinking about our storytelling techniques, looking at genre, thinking about the audience, um, and thinking, about, thinking critically about what's possible as storytellers, rather than falling back on 
traditional um, obvious ways of, of telling stories by simply reciting facts. So that's what I wanted to cover. Um, just to recap some of the key points. First of all, we've covered some very basic narrative concepts. We'll cover some more concepts in the, in the other video for this week and in the reading. But in terms of more genre and audience, I just want you to understand what they are and the role that they play in your stories and your profession more broadly. Whatever area of the media you work in, all these areas are in flux. Mode has changed, genre is changing, the audience and their role and our knowledge and construction of those is changing. Secondly, these narrative tools are tools. They can help you. This is not a critical academic exercise. This is not an academic module. This is a practical module. You will be producing stories. And what's key is that you use these narrative concepts and tools to help you as a media producer, help you think about how you approach to this adaptation. It's all about adapting to change, new platforms, new media, new modes. And finally, to think critically about narrative to ensure that you are using it as a professional in an appropriate way, that you're not falling into routines, lazy processes, stereotypes, cliches. You're actually doing things in an innovative way, in an effective way, in an original way, uh, and in, in an appropriate way. We are defining new ways of telling stories. So as we define those new ways, we should be defining it in the best possible way that's going to be accurate, factual, true, effective, and so on. You can find more information about all of this in this week's reading. And you can also look at the slides for this lecture on Moodle and um, explore any of the links related to some of the concepts involved, including any embedded videos as well.